All right, in 24, we have a Roadrunner that does it bird that tends to fly, it tends to run instead of fly. While running, the Roadrunner uses its tail as a balance. A sample of 10 Roadrunners was taken, and the bird's total length in centimeters and tail length in centimeters were recorded. It says the output shown in the table is from a least squares regression to predict tail length given total length. Okay, so we have a least squares regression. We probably have a form that you may have um, seen in your textbook. It'll probably be, it's basically like a slope intercept form, but we'll, we'll typically use A and B as your parameters. So y hat equals a plus bx. Remember, x is the um, exponential variable. Y hat is the y hat is the response or the predicted variable. So um, we say suppose a road runner, road runner has a total length of 59 centimeters and a tail length of 31 centimeters. Based on based on the residual, does the regression model overestimate or underestimate the tail length of the road runner? Okay, so what we're basically doing here is we're using the, the total length to predict tail length. So we're trying to go from total, total length to get the um, tail length. So um, we're given the total length of 59. And from that, we want to predict tail length of 31.1. So essentially, it's saying that if we were to use this equation and had our x value be 59, and then we had a y value of 31.1, is that what the equation would have predicted? So let's see what the equation would have predicted if we use this as the x value. So y hat would be a, so the a would be the constant, so it'd be the negative two, negative 1.2. 81 plus the total length coefficient. So that's a slope 0. 0.5264 x or 59. Let's see what we get here. Negative using our calculator, negative 1.281 plus 0. 0.5264 times 59. We'll get about. Twenty nine point twenty nine point seven seven six six. So this is the predicted value. The actual y value was thirty one point one. So the actual y, or just y, is thirty one point one. And so we're trying to see if this, if the regression would be, um, or the residual would be a uh, positive or negative value. And remember this recall the residual is equal to the actual value, actual y minus predicted y. In this case it'd be 31.1 minus 29.7766. So the residual is you know positive because it's about 1.3234. So that means that so so that means the so that means the predicted value, which is twenty nine, was less than the actual value. So the re, so the equation underpredicted the value for y. It underpredicted it, so it underestimated it, and that's because the residual is positive. So the answer would be a. Okay, let's look at the next one. 25. The distribution of assembly times required to assemble a certain smartphone is approximately normal with a mean of 4.6 and standard deviation of 0.6 minutes. So let's write this out. Let's draw this out. Normal with the mean of 4.6 and standard deviation of 0.6. Of the following, which, which is the closest to the percentage of assembly times between four minutes and five minutes? Let's draw a visual of a normal curve to show what we're trying to figure out. So the mean or the middle of 4.6 would be there. We're essentially trying to find the area from four to five. 
So like four or five would be over here, four would be somewhere over here. We're trying to find like that middle portion. So here we can just basically use um, a technology. You can use um, paper and pencil if you want to use Z scores, that'll take a little longer. From here, we can go into the, um, our distribution function. And then go to normal CDF. And here we'll have the lower bound followed by the upper bound. So lower bound is four, comma, upper bound is five. And then we have to enter the mean and standard deviation, which is gonna be 4.6 for the mean. And then standard deviation is 0.6 in this order. If you have a more, if you have a newer calculator, um, the more expensive brand, then you then you don't even have to really memorize the syntax. It'll have entries for you to enter to enter the mean, standard deviation, lower bound, upper bound. And so we should get about 58.9, 58.9-ish. Or we could say about 0.59. And so the answer will be C. All right, 26, a company produces millions of one pound packages of bacon every week. The company specifications allow for no more than 3% of the one pound packages to be underweight. To investigate compliance with the specifications, the company's quality control manager selected a random sample of 1,000 packages produced in one week and found that 40 packages or 4% to be underweight. Assuming all conditions for inference are met, do the data provide convincing statistical evidence at the significance level of alpha equals 0.05 that more than 3% of all packages produced in one week are underweight? Okay, so we're gonna basically conduct a significance test. And the idea is to, you know, figure out what we would get um, from this data. So let's see what type of distribution we have. So so we have that that the that the um that the population has we assume that like the the true population proportion would be um 0.03. is 0.03 and the alternative is that the true proportion is actually more than 0.03 so this we can think of this, this is our, our null hypothesis and our alternative is this so you want to see what are the odds that we'll get a that we'll get a sample proportion of more than 0.03 um, given that if we were to accept that this was a true proportion. So we want to conduct, we want to um, calculate a test statistic and, t test statistic and see what the, what the odds of getting a test statistic that extreme or more would be. So let's see what we got here. We have, um, we're gonna, we have a proportion. So we're gonna use our test statistic will be Z. And what we're gonna have is, and if you don't have any, you don't technically need to have this memorized, but you need to understand like the form. So let me just bust it up. Let me just go over here. You remember you have your form of the packet and your test statistic, test statistic would be your statistic minus your parameter. Our statistic is what we get from this data, which we found that is 4% is or 0.04. Minus our population parameter, which we are gonna say it's 0.03 because we're assuming it's 0.03. And, and in the denominator, we're gonna have the standard deviation of the statistic. Standard deviation of the statistic. And so that we're gonna basically have this as a square root, except P will be P hat. So we have the square root of 0.03 times one minus 0.03 over n or over a thousand. All that is square rooted. So we want to see what this z value would be. So use your you know use your calculator technology carefully to make sure 
you don't waste your time with a bunch of, with a bunch of tedious calculations. And we'll get about 1.8537 for Z. So again, we're looking at what would the probability of getting a Z score greater than or equal to this would be. Remember, we're, look, we have a normal distribution, standardized normal distribution where the mean would be zero, standard deviation would be one, since we converted it. And we're gonna look to, at the area to the right of 1.85-ish, which would be like over here. So let's see what that would be. So we, again, we can use our calculator, go to distribution function, normal CDF. Our lower bound would be 1.85-ish comma upper bound would be like a million or something but a very large number and since we reconverted it into standardized test statistics since it's a z-score we only need to enter a mean or standard deviation and we would get about 0.032 so this area would be about 3.2 percent about 0.032 Now, so what this is saying in context is that if it were true that the true proportion was 0.03 or 3%, then the chance of us getting 4% um, of packages being underweight, you know, from a sample of this size is only going to happen by chance 3.2% of the time. So it can happen, but the chances of it happening it's pretty low. So this gives us reason to believe that the true population proportion is not in, is not in fact 0.03, but it's probably more. So then our answer would be B. Because we have in statistical, we have statistical, statistical significant evidence to, you know, basically, you know, refute the null hypothesis. 27. The histogram show the results of three simulations of a sampling distribution of a sample mean. For each simulation, 1,500 samples of size n were selected from the same population, and the sample mean is recorded. The value of n hat was different for each of the three simulations. The different values of n, the different sample sizes. All right, so which of these is the correct ordering of the graphs from least value of n to greatest value of n? Okay, so this is kind of like a logic one and don't overthink it because maybe your initial reaction is to see, oh, which one has more space? That means more N, you know, more stuff. N refers to the sample size. Remember, these are just basically statistics that you would get from calculating uh, some, you know, some value from each of those sample sizes. In any case, the basic idea is this. The bigger your sample size is, the better, right? you always want to have a bigger sample sizes because you can make more precise predictions or more precise estimates. So if our sample sizes are bigger, that means our estimates would be, you know, more precise, meaning that there would be less variability. It would be more like, you know, less spread out. So um, the, the smallest value would be the most spread out. So this would be like the um, smallest value of n. We would put that one first. Then this would come next. Or see, C would come next. And this would have the largest sample size because it's the, it's the least spread out. So it would be A, C, B. And so our answer would be A. All right, 28. Researchers conducted a study to investigate the effects of soft drink consumption on fat stored in muscle tissue. From a sample of 80 adult volunteers, 40 were randomly selected or randomly assigned to consume one liter of a soft drink each day. The remaining 40 were asked to drink one liter of water each day and not to consume any soft drinks. At the end of the six months, the amount of fat stored in each person's muscle tissue was recorded. 
The people in the group who drank the soft drink had on average a higher percentage of fat stored in the tissue than people who only drank water. So which of these is the most appropriate um, conclusion? Okay, so when you, um, when you conduct a study, to have, a, to, have the, to have, you know, a good study, you know, you want random selection and then you want random assignment. That's always the goal. Now they're not the same thing, even though they kind of, you know, seem like they would be the same thing. So a little review of the stuff in chapter four when conducting studies. Random selection is when you just basically go to the population and pick people at random to, to be in your study. That's random selection. Um, random selection allows you to make inferences to um, people in the population. So, um, I don't know if I want to write this all out. Inferences about population. About population, pop, about pop, population. Now, random assignment is basically once you have your um, individuals um, that are going to be conduct, con, you know, you know, do the study. Random assignment is when you're where you randomly assign people in the study to one treatment and other people in the study to the other treatment. This allows you to establish cause and effect. So when you have both of these done properly, you have a pretty good experiment that you could say that there is a cause and effect or association between, you know, whatever two things you're studying, and you can apply it to all the people in the population since you're randomly selected. Now, here they had um, uh, 80 adult volunteers. So there's no random selection done, unfortunately. But there was random assignment because for, half of them were assigned to you know, only drink soft drink, they only drink, you know, soda each day, and the other half were assigned to only drink water. So we can say something about cause and effect, but only to people like those in the study. So cause and effect would apply to those, to those people that are similar to those in the study. So we can say that um, there's evidence that um, soft drinks tend to cause more fat to be stored um, than drinking only water for people like those in the study. So let's see which one of these fits that, fits that the best. There's evidence that causes them. So this, so it can't be this because it can't be generalized to all adults. There is evidence that consuming soft drinks causes more fat storage in muscle tissue than drinking only water. And the conclusion can be generalized to all, nope, still can't, doesn't matter. Wait a minute, hold on, I didn't mean, I meant to cross out B. What's going on here? So it's not A, it's not B. There is evidence that consuming soft drinks causes more fat storage in muscle tissue than drinking only water. And it can be generalized to adults similar. So that's what we, what we want, similar to, to those in the study. So the answer would be C, because they mentioned that keyword similar, or you could say like those in the study. 